people here know who he is. I just want to read a real quick little saying that a member of the audience told me about. This is from Solzhenitsyn, and this is one of the reasons I think we're all here, and we kind of have to remind ourselves why we're doing this. He says, and how we burned in the cabin later thinking, what would things have been like if every security operative, when he went out at night to make an arrest, had been uncertain whether he would return alive and had to say goodbye to his family? Or if during periods of mass arrests, as for example in Leningrad, when they arrested a quarter of the entire city, people had not simply sat there in their lairs, paling with terror at every bang on the downstairs door and every step on the staircase, but had understood that they had nothing left to lose and had boldly set up in the downstairs hall an ambush of half a dozen people with axes, hammers, pokers, whatever else was on hand. After all, you knew ahead of time that those blue caps were out at night for no good purpose. If, if, but we didn't love freedom enough. That's what makes this country great. It's not diversity, it's freedom. Yeah. Bill Cooper. Thank you, Connie. Uh, thank you. Well, you sure know how to uh, make me feel very humble. Thank you so much. I think one of the biggest misconceptions in this country is what this country is all about, who founded it, for what purpose, and most specifically, what it is that we're all looking for. I'm going to try to clarify some of those, and in doing it, as always happens, someone's going to be angry with my definition of some of these things. I've traveled all over the country. I've talked to probably hundreds of thousands of people individually over a lot of years. I've broadcast a radio show that brings me thousands of letters every week. I administer the world's largest and most successful civilian intelligence gathering operation in the world, which makes me privy to an awful lot of information that none of you will ever see, and there's so much of it, I can never present it in a form that you would be able to look at it and digest it. So that puts a pretty big burden on me and the people who work with me in the intelligence service and in the CAGI news service in order to digest this information, analyze it, and be able to present to you what we believe, and this is a subjective judgment, what you can digest and what you need to know at that particular time. And in doing this, digesting all this information, reading all of these letters from people of every kind of background that you can imagine, every race, every religion, every kind of agenda, and believe me, there's an awful lot of agendas going on in this country that are dangerous to Americans. Being promoted by people who claim to be Americans, who claim to be patriots, and who claim to be doing the best for this country, including those who want to destroy it and bring about a one world totalitarian socialist government. They sincerely believe in their heart they're doing the right thing for humankind. You see, nobody gets up in the morning and sets out to do evil. Nobody consciously does that. I've never met any person in my entire life who said, I'm evil, I'm going to do evil things, I like to do evil things, I want to do evil things. They don't exist, in my knowledge. They may exist somewhere, people like Jeffrey Dahmer. And I believe that even Jeffrey Dahmer probably rationalized what he was doing in his own mind to make it right. Isn't that the way we all do things? Even if we do something wrong and we know we're doing something wrong, don't we attempt to rationalize it in our own mind and to our friends to justify what we're doing? So I believe it's a great fallacy to set out to brand those whom we disagree with as being evil people. The result of their actions we may perceive to be evil. We may perceive it to be bad, but I guarantee you those people don't see it that way. And when we present ourselves to them in that light, we're good and they're evil, 
Do you think we have a chance of getting them to listen to us? Not on your life. It's not going to happen. So I think we have to change the way we talk. We have to talk to them in a different manner. Now don't take what I'm going to tell you standing up here today and compare it to what I say on the radio and expect the two to concur. Because when I'm here, I'm just Bill Cooper. I'm talking to you from my heart. When I'm on the radio, I am on a mission. And that mission is to slap people upside the head and wake them up and even make them hate me if that's what it takes to get them to go examine what I'm telling them to find out that it's right. You see, I don't care how it's done as long as they wake up. And if I have to be the bad guy that they're going to hate for the rest of their life, that's okay with me if I wake them up. But when I'm here talking like this, that's not my mission. Because you're awake already or you wouldn't be here. You see? There's a difference between the people here and the people that I'm talking to over those airwaves. Big difference. An awful lot of you are steady listeners of the hour of the time and have been probably for many years. And when I'm talking on the radio, I know who you are and I'm not talking to you. And I know that when you're listening and I talk about the sheeple, the stupid sheeple, it doesn't make you angry. You know why? Because you know you're not stupid sheeple, don't you? The person that gets angry has verified that I was right. Because he wouldn't get angry if he didn't know in his heart that he's a stupid sheeple. You ever been walking down the street and somebody comes running out and says, Bank robber! Bank robber! Stop that bank robber! Do you start running? <laughs> Why don't you start running? Because you're not the bank robber, right? Do you get angry? No. Do you pay attention most of the time? If you're from a big city, chances are you don't even look around. Right? Now, if you're from a small town where I'm at, I mean, people will come running out in the street to see the bank robber because it's a small town and not much excitement goes on there unless the IRS comes to mess with me. <laughs> so, what I'm going to talk to you about today comes from my heart, from my experience in life, from playing this role as messenger, which I take very seriously, from my efforts to wake up the American people, from my family, from all the letters that I get, from people that I talk to, just like I've talked to many of you here today, I've learned some things. And I think these things need to be passed on to you. And I think you need to start examining yourself, your agenda, your mission. Who are you? What are you about? What do you believe about America? Is it true? Are you helping to divide us more? Or are you helping to bring us together? Do you really understand what this country is all about? Now, I know this is going to make some of you angry. That's okay. I know that it's going to open some doors for some of you. I hope that it will bring us all a little bit closer together. And I hope that everybody, once you've examined your own particular agenda, will try to make it fit better into what we should really be doing. And I'm going to start off way back in history, folks, because that's really where it began. The human race is young in the, in the whole scope of the life of the, of the Earth. We're just a a young species really haven't been around for a long time compared to everything else that's in this world and I'm not talking about biblical years and I'm not talking about theory of evolution years I'm talking about from the time when you can see that man emerged on the historical scale of this world and began to affect other species and the world that we live in, and himself, by perfecting the ability to think. First original thought. See, there used to be a time in history 
when man was just like all the other animals, he didn't think, he didn't know good from evil. He existed, lived by instinct, just like the other animals did. If you want to believe the record that we can look back and see written in stone. Okay? If you want to believe that there were creatures that ultimately became this thinking man that you see standing up here in front of you and sitting out there amongst you, didn't have this ability. Now if you doubt that, read Genesis in the Bible and you'll see that it's confirmed there. Wasn't there a time when Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden? They were not to think. They did not know good from evil. They were just there to take care of the garden. Is that correct? So this concept and the biblical concept agree. Man just enjoyed what God had put there and sort of took care of the garden. Any dentist will tell you that our mouth was not made for eating meat. So ancient man most probably ate vegetables and nuts and things like that. Roots. Doesn't mean that I'm telling you to become a vegetarian because I'm not. You see, I really believe in freedom. I believe you should eat whatever you feel like eating. That's your business. But that's known to people who study these things as the age of innocence. Something happened that brought man out of that state, and if you're talking from a biblical reference, out of the Garden of Eden and into the world. He wasn't innocent anymore. He understood that he was naked, and that his partner was naked. He could think. He could look around. He knew when something was good and when it was bad, just as we all do here. When somebody comes up to me and says, well, how do we know which is the right way to go? I know that person is setting me up to justify his bad deeds, and I won't do it. You always know. We always know which is the right way and which is the bad way. The bad way sometimes feels better, so we may choose that way and justify it by rationalization in order to make ourselves feel better about the bad that we did. In the mystery schools, they refer to this mystical time of coming out of the age of innocence as the Luciferian philosophy. I've tried to illuminate you with this for years on my radio broadcast. In the Bible, or in the church, they talk about the fall of man. Same thing. There's only one difference between the Luciferian philosophy and the fall of man is that those who talk about the fall of man believe in God whether or not they believe in a savior they believe in God the ones who believe in the Luciferian philosophy do not now here's how that works in the Bible, we're told that Eve was tempted by Satan to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God had commanded Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit of that tree. If you do, ye will surely die. Isn't that the commandment? Lucifer, through his agent Satan, on the other hand, told Eve, God lied to you. He's holding back the fact that you too can become God. But first you have to eat of the fruit of this tree. And if you do, you will surely not die, but shall become as gods. Isn't that true? So, from the religious aspect, we see that as the fall of man because man disobeyed God. We see that as the subjugation of the woman beneath man where she had originally been the partner, now she is subjugated beneath man because she was the agent of man's downfall. Is that correct? Now, I'm not talking right or wrong. I'm not trying to insult anybody in here. I'm just telling you what we're taught. 
so that we all understand what we're talking about because that's most important. If you understand something differently than what I'm trying to impart to you up here, and we don't have the same definition, we're not going to understand each other, are we? The mysteries, on the other hand, look at this in a different light. Here's their story. It's a metaphor. They don't believe that there ever was a God, or that there ever is a God, aside from man himself. And man has not reached that state yet, but can, and this is what they teach in the lodges, that if you perfect yourself as the temple of the God within and become Christed, you've all heard this in the New Age movement, you too can become God. In her movie, running on the beach, spinning around, I am God. Go <laughs> ask her early in the morning when she just wakes up and goes and sits in front of the mirror and looks at her aging face and tries to cover it up with makeup if she's got. She may tell you a different story about that time. Around noon, she might be feeling better and become God again. But this is the reality of the human condition. We'd all love to be gods, wouldn't we? My question to Shirley MacLaine at one time was, please, Shirley, could you make me a universe? She sort of looked at me with this hurt look on her face as she confronted her mortality and realized that she was not God because she could not make me a universe. She couldn't even make herself a universe. She can't even make herself look young again. She's having a hard time paying some of her debts. God doesn't have that problem, does he? And in her case, she. <coughs> Here's the way they look at it. Here's their metaphor for the end of innocence. Adam and Eve were held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, cruel, and vindictive God. Until Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free from this garden by giving him the gift of intellect. Through the use of intellect, man will conquer the earth, will conquer nature, and will himself become God. It's taught in every Masonic temple in this land, every secret brotherhood, every secret society, Every mystical temple, every occult organization teaches the Luciferian philosophy. They do not believe in Lucifer. They do not believe in any entity called a devil, and they do not believe in God. It is a mistake for you to assume that they do. They are atheists in the strictest sense of the word. They are humanists. That's their religion. At the highest level, their goal is to create a world in which the adepts, the thousand points of light, working behind the veil to create the culmination of the great plan, can realize the ultimate happiness for mankind. That's why they don't oppose pornography. That's why they don't oppose certain crimes. That's why they say you should not be put in jail for the rest of your life for murder or anything else. There should be no death penalty because it was a learning experience. <laughs> and having gone through that learning experience, you're a better person now. This is what they teach. They believe punishment for these crimes is nothing more than vengeful retribution, which is wrong in their eyes. So these are really the two philosophies that we have competing with each other in the world today. Who brought man the gift of fire? Prometheus. Who was Prometheus? Lucifer. What was the gift of fire? Knowledge, intellect. 
Hasn't man created industry, culture, society, science from the use of one solitary thing? Fire. Without fire, none of it would have occurred. None of it. Nothing. There would be no society without fire. That's how it's represented in the ancient myths and in the mysteries. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? What is it represented as? A bolt of lightning struck a tree. The tree burst into flames. Ancient man, if you watch the movie Quest for Fire, rushed up and grabbed one of the burning branches and it burned his hand and he let it go. He probably didn't go any farther than that the first time. Second time he may have found a deer that had been roasted by the heat of the fire in the forest. And being hungry, maybe he partook of some of that meat and found that it tasted pretty good. Also the fire was warm and didn't get cold at night. And this is where the whole battle between the forces of light and darkness comes from. Man sat upon a rock one night watching the sunset and said, Boy, I'm in deep trouble now. I can't see in the dark. There's wild beasts out there. There's tigers with teeth seven inches long that want me for dinner. What am I going to do? He didn't know what to do. Neither would many of us put in that situation. But we would know one thing, we're in deep trouble. And so for a good part of his history, man sat huddled in the darkness in some place that made him feel secure, waiting to be saved. Now remember, folks, I'm not telling you what I believe. I'm telling you what is taught in the mysteries. I'm telling you what our enemies believe. Make no mistake about it, they are our mortal enemies. They want to see us wiped off the face of the earth. Man huddled in this darkness, fearful, trembling, cold, hungry. And around about he could hear the beasts roaring. And sometimes they were roaring because they were after him. And sometimes he was eaten. A man eventually saw another tree struck by lightning and grabbed that branch with that flame on it and by a little experimentation he learned how to keep that fire going. And if he could keep the fire going he knew something nobody else knew and he became the first king, the first priest, the first scientist, all rolled into one. And he would burn this fire and keep it going. Another man in the cold of the night wanting to escape from the terrors that were out there who gravitate toward this glow and they would see this man sitting there and if he was kind he would let them come to the fire and they would be warm and they would be protected because if the wild beast came he would pick up a branch and shove it in its face and the beast would go away and so the forces of light overcame the forces of darkness and in the sunshine of the morning, the newly risen, resurrected child that had died the night before, their Savior warmed them and saved them from the terrors of the Prince of Darkness. You have to study these things to understand your enemy. Any general who ventures upon a battlefield without understanding the enemy is doomed to defeat. Just like a militia that forms itself upon a peninsula has already created its own concentration camp. Unless it has a navy. good militia, I might add. What is the upshot of this? What am I getting at here? These people believe 
and they have conducted themselves according to their belief and their philosophy since the very dawn of man. These people learned how to control others through the use of a hidden knowledge. This ability to keep that fire going was a technology that nobody else knew. By observing the fire, by keeping it going, by creating ceremonies around this fire, they became a mystery to the others. A mystery always holds sway over those who don't understand it. And the priesthood was born. No king ever existed without the permission of the priesthood. And I don't care what religion you're talking about or what period of history you're talking about, it is the truth. The kings never had the power and don't to this day. Kings exist at the whim of the real power which is the priesthood standing behind the throne. And when the king ceased to be a benefit to the priesthood, they would simply poison him or get rid of him in some other way. The king is dead, long live the king, and there would be another king appointed. There was even a time in history when the king was a sacrificial king, just like John F. Kennedy was in the Temple of the Sun known as Dealey Plaza. They would pick a young man at the height of his virility, appoint him king for one year. During that time, he could do or say or command whatever he wanted. The priesthood was always there to make sure he commanded the right things, have any woman that he wanted. And at the end of the year, he was ceremoniously sacrificed upon a rock, his heart ripped out, his body dismembered into 14 pieces and scattered over the land. And this is where the legend of the Osirian cycle began. It was to ensure the fertility of the crops of the next year. And young men would volunteer for this in their patriotic duty to their kingdom, to their family, so that they could have prosperous years. Much as our young men may volunteer to rush out over the water to a place called Kuwait or Iraq and die in the godforsaken sands of a place that nobody can even find on a map I never heard of until it happened all so that he can be called a patriot someone his family can be proud of it escapes me how they can ever arrive at these conclusions but they do and the priesthood always takes the most advantage of this willingness to sacrifice oneself upon the altar of his country the problem with it is it's very seldom really for the country it's for the advancement of the agenda of the priesthood whoever the priests happen to be at the time. Am I attacking the church? You better believe it. All churches, all organized religions that have existed since the beginning of the time. Am I attacking the religion of individuals? Never, not on your life. He wasn't trying to create a big church. He knew what happened to those things. And you're all wrong about that man. When you say he shouldn't get angry. He shouldn't curse. He shouldn't do things that upset other people. Because that's what Jesus spent his whole life doing. He threw the money changers out of the temple. Don't you think that made some people angry? Don't you think it was rude to walk up to somebody's place of business, smack them in the mouth, grab their table, and throw it out the door? Yeah. What about the time he cursed the fig tree? You know, pious Christians sometimes make me very angry. They don't even know Christianity. They don't know the man they're following. He was a revolutionary. He was a dangerous man. And by God, so am I. 
And so should you be. This country was founded by dangerous men. And the moment the people in this country cease to be dangerous men, it's going to be the day we cease to have a country. Their whole goal with this philosophy is to teach all men and women that the only end of life is to seek the utmost pleasure and happiness that you can get out of it because when you die there's nothing else. That's what they teach. That's what they want you to be. They don't want laws against sexual promiscuity. That's why they don't want families. That's why they don't want marriage. That's why they encourage homosexuality. There's a method to their madness. There's really not much method to yours. Because you're operating from a place of ignorance. And until you change that, you're going to be bumbling around, bumping into each other, saying and doing the wrong things, not understanding the nature of your en enemy. And if you don't understand the nature of your enemy and the weapons they use, you cannot fight that enemy. You can't fight the battle. You shouldn't even be on the battlefield. That's why you're losing the war. And don't tell me you're not, because I'm in a place of great knowledge about who's winning and who's losing this war. And I can assure you, you're losing the war. Doesn't mean it can't be turned around. But it'll never be turned around until you learn what you need to know. You don't even recognize half the weapons that they use against you. And some of them seem so insignificant that you don't even try. They want to create a world where everybody is happy all the time. Doing all of the things that, if you're from a good religious upbringing, is wrong to do. If you're not from a religious upbringing, but you have a good brain and you understand the purpose of morals and ethics, it's still the wrong thing to do. If you're a thinking person. And then the priests had an army. Oh boy, weren't they happy with that? Their whole purpose throughout history has been to teach a small number of people how to become adept at controlling everyone else and presenting their societies as desirable to the profane so that you'll go knock on the door and say, hey, can I be a member and be initiated with the promise of learning some great secret. What is that secret? The secret is what I have just told you this morning. The secret is how to control everybody else. And you never understand how to control everybody else until you get to the top of this pyramid of initiation. Most people never make it past the third step. All above that are carefully chosen and nurtured and taught. And Americans for all these years have been looking around for the enemy. They've never been able to find an enemy. So those who control them were able to control them even better by giving them an enemy. That's what Stalin and Churchill and Roosevelt determined at Yalta. Who was going to be the enemy post-war? Turned out to be Stalin. And there was going to be this phony Cold War so that the population would never discover the real enemy. And I'm talking about the population of the Soviet Union as well as the rest of the world. You see, the enemy has always been here. It's your uncle, your aunt, your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your nephew, your nieces who belong to the fraternal orders collectively known as the mysteries. The very highest degrees of which, combined together, make up a secret order known as the Illuminati. Their goal is to destroy all existing religions save theirs, all existing governments, save theirs, 
and shackle the mob in a system of eternal oppressive debt chained to a computer for the rest of their life in a propagandized world to make them believe that they are happy in this system. Now do you think they're succeeding? Yes. Haven't I described to you just now exactly what is going on in the world today? Yes, they're succeeding. They're succeeding because the American people don't understand their enemy. They don't even know what's happening. People were extolling the virtues, the virtues of Pat Buchanan and actually considering voting for that man for president. And he sent them all a postcard. And on the front of that postcard, he identified himself as a high priest of the mysteries. Because on the front of his Christmas cards that he sent to all of his followers was the penis of Osiris, the phallus, the obelisk, with a nice red bow tied around the base which represented the testes. You know what he was saying to you? Are there any children in here? He was saying, he was laughing at you. And so was every other member of the Illuminati. He's a highly degreed member of the sovereign and military order of the Knights of Malta, which was taken over in the Peasants' Revolt in England by the Knights Templars who had sworn revenge upon the old Hospitallers of St. John's, which later became the Knights of Malta because of their role in the suppression of the Templars. How many of you watch Trinity Network? How many of you watch Pat Robertson? You ever seen the cross in the crown? Do you know what that means? It's the symbol of the Templars. The Knights Templar. It is the symbol of the unification of the church and the government over the people. Is that what you want? Every time any church gets control of government, the people suffer. It has always happened. That's why our founding fathers established a country where that was not supposed to happen, where everybody was free to worship at the altar of their choice. And if you think they were all of one mind, you better think again. How many religions of the Protestant group do you think existed in this country? when our founding fathers put together the Constitution. Over 1,500 different groups all claiming they were right, teaching a different dogma, quoting scripture to justify what they said, and everybody else was going to hell. So don't give you this Christian nation bullshit, because that's what it is. This nation reflected Christian values because the people who made up the government in the early days were Christian, but none of them agreed with each other, and they still don't today. They very seldom ever have. What do you mean by Christian? Seventh-day Adventist? Branch Davidian? We need to do some serious evaluating, some very serious checking out of agendas. You really want to take over the government and make it a theocracy? Because I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen if you do that. You're going to burn people at the stake who disagree with you. And if that happens, I'm going to have to take up arms all over again. And so will many of you because you're going to be persecuted. You see? Because whichever one controls the government, you're going to have to conform to that teaching. And if you don't believe in it, you're a heretic. Do you understand what I'm talking about? What is our common bond truly? Freedom. Freedom. Without freedom, you can't be a Christian no matter what denomination you belong to. You can't be a Buddhist. You can't own a donut shop. You can't drive from here to Oregon. You can't be an American because that's what it's all about, and that's the only thing that it's all about. Nothing else. Nothing else. 
It's about freedom. Freedom. Only freedom. It means you have to let other people be free, even if they disagree with you. I had a tremendous admiration for the courage of those two communists who had the guts to walk up with their little communist sign and their communist flag. Two of them, young people, all alone in that sea of America, militia, uniformed patriots. And I saw people who wanted to kill them. You know, I don't like their philosophy. They're misled, misguided. Communism is a terrible thing. But they had guts. And I had a great respect for them. And I believe in freedom. Which means there is no way in the world that we could have had that meeting on your state house grounds this morning unless they had the right to do what they did. Then you had better understand that. Because if you stop them from having their freedom to make their political statement, you have stopped yourself. You have stopped everyone. And that must never happen in this country. It must never happen in this country. Because if it does, there will never be another congregation like this and you'll never hear me speak again because I'll be dead. And so will most of you. This country is about freedom. Because only with freedom can you have all of the other things that everybody professes that they want. It's the only way it can be done. I hear all kinds of misconceptions and misstatements. I have the freedom of the press. No, you don't. No, you don't. The man who owns the press has the freedom of the press. And he can say in his press whatever he wants, but you can't. That's why I get angry with Americans when they say, the Jews control the press. Who sold it to them? They get it. You want the press? Start a press. You want to be on the radio? Do it. But stop whining. Stop bitching. Stop complaining. That guy that owns the press, that's his press. He can do with it what he wants. Just like you do with your car what you want because it's your property. He doesn't owe you anything unless you've got a contract with his signature on it that says he will print what you say. If you can't produce that, he doesn't owe you anything. That's America. You know what's wonderful about America? You can have a press. I have a press. How many of you have seen my newspaper? That newspaper is no joke. It makes congressmen cringe when they see it. It scares the hell out of the enemy. You too can have a radio show. I'm going to teach you how just here in just a couple of minutes. You too can publish books like this. I did it. The Harvest Trust is the trust for my children. I'm not rich. I don't have anything. You know how I financed this book? I sold copies before it was printed to people who believed enough in me to buy them. I don't have any money. I have my family. And that's all the wealth I ever need. I don't make any money from my radio show. Veritas is operated in the red from the beginning. It probably always will. But I got something that you don't have. I have a free press. It's mine. And I get to say what I want. And I get to publish what I want. And print what I want. Because it's mine. And I'm free. And it's my free press. That's why I don't care if somebody calls up my radio show and says they don't like what I say. Screw you. Get your own show. <laughs> I don't.
don't care that they complain because I won't let them talk on my radio show. Screw you. Get your own radio show. This is mine. belongs to me. I don't have any contract with you. I don't owe you anything. I was speaking in California one time. A lady stood up in the middle of the crowd and said, You make me so angry. You're a terrible man. Why didn't you tell me this years ago? She was lucky I was telling her then. I didn't owe her anything. But she blamed me because she didn't have the information that I was imparting to her on that day years ago. And I had it years before that. I didn't know how to do it. I would have. Oh, God, I would have. You don't really understand sometimes what a terrible burden it is to know some of the things that I know and try to wake people up and impart this knowledge to them and find out that they just have walls built in front of them. They want to be slaves. But we're making some chinks in those walls. You too can have a free press and that's what it's going to take to get this country back without bloodshed. And I'm going to tell you right now, unless we can be successful in creating a real free press where the American people get different viewpoints other than those expressed in the establishment controlled media, there's going to be a civil war in this country and it's going to come soon. The only thing that can stop it is by waking up vast amounts of sleeping people. Sheeple is what they are. They are following the Judas goat right into the shearing pens and from there they will go to the slaughter and they will not know that anything is wrong until they smell the blood of the sheeple in front of them. Anybody can publish a newsletter or a newspaper. Anybody. It is not expensive. It is not difficult. And everyone in this room should be doing it all across this country. And everybody that you come in contact with, you should encourage them to do it. And we should flood this nation with information. Not rumor. Not opinion. Not bullshit. Documented fact. Everything you print must be documented. If it's not, eventually people will stop reading your newsletter or your newspaper. Because all they have to do is check out a few things and find out it's not true and you're finished. You must publish only documented fact. And you must stay away from printing articles from people who will not document as fact what they put in their articles. That's why my broadcast scares the hell out of socialists. That's why in a White House memorandum, I was named as the most dangerous radio host in America, not because I'm going to go out and shoot somebody, but because I shoot documented facts, which cannot be refuted. That's why. That's what's dangerous. Seek ye the truth, and the truth will make you free, and nothing else will do it. Jesus Christ has never lied to anybody. Why won't you listen to him? Don't spread a rumor. Spread the truth. Document it. Prove it. Make it irrefutable and you too will become dangerous to those who admire us in lies and enslave us in socialism. Any time any system makes you dependent upon anybody or anything or any system, you are enslaved. Understand that doesn't have to be chains of iron. You don't have to be hanging up on a wall. You just have to be obligated. That's all it takes. You too can have your own radio station and broadcast anything that you want. You can broadcast your own shows. You can be your own host on that show. You can broadcast tapes of other shows. We encourage people to buy satellite receiving stations across this country purchase a very simple FM low power transmitting kit and set up their own FM radio station in their hometown and we now have over 670 people across the nation it's not expensive if one person cannot afford the cost what is wrong 
with 8 or 10 or 15 or 20 of you getting together, pooling your money, buying one satellite receiving station, a small FM low power transmitter, and setting up your own broadcasting station. I hope you will broadcast the truth and not some agenda. You see, what happens when you broadcast the truth is you piss everybody off. <laughs> If you don't have my address, I want you to write it down. It's the Harvest Trust, P.O. Box 1970. I'll repeat it a couple of times. Eager, Arizona. Eager is spelled E-A-G-A-R, Arizona, 85925. That's the Harvest Trust, P.O. Box 1970. Eager, Arizona, 85925. If you have purchased Oklahoma City Day 1, it's on the back cover at the bottom. If you don't have a pen and you would like to have the address, you can go up to my wife's table upstairs on the second floor and get one of our flyers. The address will be on the flyer. And all you have to do is purchase that equipment, set it up, hook it into the satellite receiver, and you're on the air with your own radio station within just a few weeks. Broadcasting the Worldwide Freedom Radio Network are your own shows, our other networks that are up there that are Patriot Broadcasting, such as Amerinet and others. Understand this, too. I'm not trying to tell you what the truth is because sometimes the truth is extremely difficult to find. And sometimes we believe we're broadcasting the truth and it turns out we really aren't. But if we find out we aren't, we must be willing and instantly able to go on the air and say we were wrong and correct it. That's a responsibility that we all have to carry. It's embarrassing. I've had to do it several times because I'm a human being. I make mistakes too. The only difference being when I make a mistake, it's usually not forgivable. <laughs> it's what happens when you become a public figure. Your wife can make a mistake, but Rush Limbaugh never! Right? <laughs> I want you all to get interested in this. All of you should be publishing a newsletter or a newspaper. All of you should be documenting what you publish. All of you should have a satellite receiving station and be rebroadcasting programming to your neighborhood. All you got to do is make sure that you're broadcasting on a frequency that's not interfering with any other broadcast. Which means you don't just check it at your house. You get in your car and you drive out 25 miles and all around and you make sure that there's nobody else on that frequency before you use it. So you know you're safe. In my little town of Eager, which is a very small town, between Springerville and Eager is two miles. Another two miles either way, and you've covered everybody in the valley. And I'm up on a big mountain in the middle of this valley where the town surrounds the mountain, and I'm broadcasting six miles in every direction in my town. And it's militia country. Arizona is dangerous for socialists. And when the war starts, heaven help whoever they send to fight in Arizona. Because it's still really kind of like the old West days in a lot of places. It's dangerous. Where I live, Ike Clanton made the sheriff angry one day. The sheriff rode 25 miles, grabbed Ike Clanton by his hair and drug him to jail. By his hair. Which brings me close to the end of my, I think it is. How much time do I have? Three more hours. <laughs> uh, uh, come back after Jim talks a little bit and we'll talk some more. Yeah, just let me, let me, uh, let me, let me give you a little parting, parting note here. I'll be back up as well with, uh, as, as will the others to answer questions later. Mr. Collins has to catch a plane, so I'm going to cut my talk short and uh, 
uh, please give him your undivided attention. I'm going to tell you right now because I deal in reality. I'm going to vote for Charles Collins, but at the same time, I'm a realist. And everybody in this room should be voting for Charles Collins, but at the same time understanding he's not going to be the president of the United States. Okay? And I'm only telling you that so that you're dealing in reality. Okay? But he is the best man on any ballot in this country. Thank you. Stars and stripes forever. 